Yeah, so the topic of this panel is, oh, basically it's trustworthy AI. The original title of the panel was, what was it? Can imitation become understanding? And I guess that really comes down to what you mean by understanding. So if I asked both of you to describe the word, I'd say you'd come up with different definitions, but yeah, I think that's a good place to start. What's your definition of understanding? Do you want to start, Monica? Well, for language and actually for image data also, it turns out one very short, def I mean, I have multiple definitions, but when one very short definition of understanding is corpus congruence. Understanding is corpus congruence. If you have seen something before, it's in your own, uh, you have learned it and, and you can uh, basically, as you recognize it as something you've seen in a context before, you can see it, uh, recognize it again. Take for instance, learning a foreign language, like say French for an American. Uh, uh, basically, if you're reading a book in French and there's a word you've never seen before, uh, you might be tempted to look it up. I just pass by it and, and, and basically try to remember it. And you see it a few times in various contexts, you suddenly understand what the word means. You don't need a dictionary. And, and so that's basically what's gonna happen in, in, in our uh, language understanding systems is that they're gonna figure out the meaning uh, of every concept over time and in, in, in the concept in context. I've given this talk so many times I can say uh, uh, concept in context without stumbling, yes. Um, so uh, that's basically the easiest definition is to say that uh, it's uh, something that has made it into your experience um, that you can recognize again. Most of cognition is recognition. So that's a start for me. It seems to me that a model is the recreation of an observed pattern as a causal structure. And the causal structure is a network of transition that is conditional yeah. on state. Correct. And an algorithm represents a causal structure in a form that you can reason about. And uh, when we talk about understanding in general, we mean something slightly more than the creation of a model or the, uh, the recreation of the observed pattern as the causal structure. But we are talking about the establishment of a relationship between the observations or between a domain and a larger domain. And the larger domain that we typically talk about is the universe or a universe. So basically we talk about a, a global coherent system of meaning uh, to which we create a connection. And that means we identify the set of relationships that connect this new domain or this new feature or this new observation to the existing body of knowledge. So that sounds very different from your, uh, your version, Monica, but it sounds like yeah, you're also I agreeing with it. I would like to uh, mention a little interesting detail here, which is uh, builds on what Joshua said, which is understanding, well, learning something. Learning is a creative act because you have to decide how the new learnings, the new information fits in with the old. And there's tricks to do this right, which I use. But it's, it's basically one of the things that you have to do uh, when you're learning stuff is that you have to figure out how it relates to what you already know. And it's part of understanding. Maybe let's talk about what creativity means then. Because mm -hmm. I suspect that not every decision is creative. Uh, right. Decision making is related to this, uh, for us to free will, right? It's because we cannot predict a decision before we make it. Um, we basically operate subjectively at the frontier where the uncertain gets turned into things that we know how to do. And mm -hmm. so in some sense, what when we make a decision, we uh, move into a domain in which we have not made the decision before. We perform some kind of uh, calculation that we haven't done before. And subjectively, mm -hmm. free will is the decision-making under uncertainty, or it's a subjective model of that, of decision-making yep. under uncertainty. This is what it represents. But uh, creativity is not the same. Creativity is special. It's, I think, the generative mode of our mind. And in the generative mm -hmm. mode, we basically extrapolate the known things and random seeds that we throw into the unknown. And then we mm -hmm. try to build a coherent structure out of it. And uh, we do this, we often have to walk back 
and discard earlier assumptions and earlier seeds or modify them until a coherent structure emerges. So mm -hmm. creativity is a particular type of search process. It's a, it's a very um, generative mode. It's also interesting to notice that there are two modes of communication and modeling. One is that you would tell people about the model that you have in your mind, which yes. is an extrapolation that allows you to simulate reality. The other one is what use are certain to be the case, which is the superposition of all those possible models. But mm -hmm. over those superposition, you cannot reason very well because it's full of uncertainties. Right. And science as often uh, agrees upon only using the second mode. Right. So mm -hmm. it's very hard to publish a theory or discuss a theory in which uncertainty features uh, as a stepping stone to inference, which means right. uh, scientists tend to write about what they can hope to prove rather than uh, over their belief, because what they believe is, is in the domain of the possible. And this leads to interesting perversions. Like before the pandemic, I thought I believed in evidence-based medicine. And then the CDC and the FDA explained to me what they mean by evidence, what they understand to be evidence. And now I think we need probabilistic medicine. But there is a, it's a very interesting thing going on in, in the way in which our scientific process works that seems to be somewhat broken. But there is also this issue that a lot of, of the more creative researchers do not make a distinction between what they hope to, can, uh, to be true, which means the superposition of all the things that could be true, all the possibilities uh, abated by the probabilities that you get by weighting the evidence versus the thing that you are seeing, which is the causal structure that you see in your own mind. And as computer scientists, we tend to think that our understanding is the creation of the algorithm. It's not the creation of the domain. If we create that algorithm, we can run a simulation in our own brain. That's awesome, right? But the world could also be different. And as a computer scientist, you are interested in finding one solution that actually works. So very often for us, programming is uh, or understanding is somehow identical to discovering the algorithm. But at some level, it's not. Yep. There is a lot to unpack there. We can get into a slightly advanced topic that's very related to this, and that is um, the idea of context-free models versus context-containing um, models. And the way I like to explain that is if you are trying to learn how to ski downhill or snowboard, um, it's really how, I mean, suppose you have a good friend who's a good snowboarder and he tries to teach you how to snowboard by texting to you. How would that work? It might work a little bit, but basically what we're saying is that snowboarding is something that contains your own sense of balance, your own muscles, your own uh, uh, stance, etc. All of those things had to be learned by you, just like you had to learn to walk when you were one year old. And uh, uh, you have to learn uh, the correct responses to balance shifts that happen because of terrain, et cetera. And when you start this process out, uh, you maybe you have a ski teacher or whatever that basically explains to you, you know, you hold your body like this and you uh, go face downhill and you try and you fall flat and you fall flat and you fall flat. And after a while you manage to get it right. So the problem is basically that this internal structure that contains your own sense of balance and your own muscle movements and all of that stuff that comes from your body, it cannot be communicated because we don't have words for explaining how our balance system works at this very moment. What we have to do is we have to go up multiple levels of abstractions until we get to something we can call context-free models. They are pure models. They have no ties to any of the lower level stuff. We have discarded everything on the way up by using epistemic reduction. At this top level, uh, we can now use that for language generation. And now we can talk about this stuff, but we can only talk about the stuff that's general, that basically is context-free. We can't talk about our sense of balance. And um, this is what we are, are, are basically stuck with when we're trying to use a reductionist transfer, which is basically language uh, about uh, explaining something in language or in equations or whatever. Rather, but in deep learning, we have an interesting hack, which means that the memory image that we're creating, the competences, I call it, it can be freely copied a million times. So you don't have, once you have one, AI that knows how to ski, anybody will know how to ski. And so uh, that is, uh, but you have to have, and you can share that 
all the way down to the bottom. You don't have to have a context-free system. You can share your entire memory with another uh, computer that loads the same stuff. So I think that's a fascinating difference that, that you can communicate context-free models, but you cannot communicate context polluted models. There yeah, might be a way to do that. And this has to do with embodiment. I tend to uh, have the same position as Monica, especially because I am pissed off by the uh, embodimentalists, which often are superstitious people. And uh, they're not always. There is something uh, interesting going on when we think about the way in which we learn. The reason why the world is learnable by us is twofold. One is information preservation. If there was no information carried over from one frame to the next, there would be nothing for us to learn. And this assumption that basically no information in the world disappears, but everything that is happening in the world is caused by information that was there already earlier in the scene, even if we could not see it, might have been there in hidden form. This is, is what allows us to learn. The other aspect is that everything that's interesting is the result of some kind of controller. And uh, so if you see structure in the world, there's usually some controller nearby that produces the structure. And if something is being controlled, it means that the controller needs to implement a model of what it controls, which means if it's controllable, uh, learnable for the controller, it's probably also learnable for you. So uh, we live in a world and most of the interesting things are the result of some kind of agent that is, <clears throat> or some kind of uh, even simpler thing, a simple mechanism that is producing what you're looking at and therefore, you can retrace the steps of what that's happening. And this basically gives you a lot of interesting priors, information preservation, mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that uh, there are controllers in the world to model reality. And the way in which our brain models reality has to do with basically filtering out invariances out of the change to make the um, change manageable. And we built uh, the best model that we can do with uh, the amount of recurrent layers that we have. And it turns out if we entangle a system in real time with the world then there, uh, and we have a known architecture, then there is probably an optimal embedding space that results from the encoding with this network. And there is probably an optimal language to navigate this embedding space, which means that unlike natural language, which is somewhat arbitrary and where the only constraint is how to translate a hierarchical fuzzy hypergraph into a discrete string of symbols, if your stack depth is no more than four, um, and you, all the design decisions are contingent on that. Uh, the languages that we have used uh, that exist, for instance, in the internal language of thought, and that might exist in ecosystems and so on, are not negotiated. They are discovered. There might be a minimal amount of uh, negotiation in there, but mostly it's a discovery. And the, this means that there needs to be a canonical shape for languages. And the canonical shape can simply emerge of, out of the known complexity or the assumed complexity can just guess of the system that does the modeling and being entangled to the same universe in real time that you try to model through some kind of resonance. So in some sense, our brain can be understood as a big resonator. And this resonator is creating all sorts of um, resonant loops that uh, eventually model patterns in a space and these patterns are moving through the space and it's not going to be at the level, uh, resolution of quantum mechanics or at the resolution of atoms but at a much much higher one but within this much more coarse grained resolution we are able to discover moving objects and their interactions and we find that we are in a shared space in which we can communicate across systems that is something that we uh, so far do not understand very well in machine learning and ai because almost none of our systems are real time and uh, basically, I feel that I am about to enter a period in my life where I'm mostly interested in this and uh, move away from the idea of hermetic universes that are connected uh, only within their own box that is hermetically sealed and air-gapped away from the rest of the universe and has to infer the structure of the universe by ma making statistics over Wikipedia. Hmm. But I'm not one of the people who religiously believe that this is not possible. I, I'm, I'm just try, slowly coming around to the other side. So there is a, a number, of, we, we have a number, especially I have a lot number of saving graces. And one of them is that language is very sparse. And so uh, I can build these networks that basically remember everything you've ever seen and they still don't take that much memory. So, yeah. 
It will be very interesting, of course, to uh, benchmark your models against the current methods that exist in NLP. Like, if you can show that you just built a better transformer, uh, then yep. I think people will jump on this, and it will be a very short amount yes. of time before yes, this of is course. going to become and, a dominant uh, method. The, yes, and the, of course, the answer is I can't at the moment. I, not before at least getting a bigger machine. I mean, what I have demonstrates the principles. It's a proof of concept. And it also works really, really quickly, really fast, really cheap. I mean, the amount of energy that you put into 100 TPU based machines for a month, that's like millions of dollars worth of electricity. And I can do that on a, on a Raspberry, uh, on a laptop or whatever. So uh, it's, uh, it's a different beast. It, it can't be compared directly. And one of the things that comes up if you want to use, uh, compare my system to the others is that most of the tests in the benchmark suite, such as glue and super glue, are basically, uh, they are test suites from way back when, when we did NLP, because making test suites is so boring that nobody wants to do them. So everybody uses the existing ones. And most of them today are built from machines that have some reasoning capability. All the tests, uh, yeah, half of the tests easily, I cannot do at all because I'm building a machine that does 100% understanding, no reasoning. And therefore, I, I can't. Uh, I can basically cannot beat the state of the art. But I'm, uh, and that's. I basically think that the the test suites that we're looking at are are not what we want because they the adversarial nature of them uh, gives you very low numbers and you don't know how good it is uh, in reality in a non-adversarial situation. If you're talking to a teller bot in your bank. You're not interested in tripping it up because it's going to trip up with your money. You want it to you want to communicate as clearly as possible what you mean to the teller bot so it does the right thing. So I think adversarial corpora are the wrong thing to do. We want to do really well on, on people who want to, uh, the robot to understand. And that's kind of a goal that we can go for. So just as a intuition prompt slash prompt. Uh, yes, as I mentioned earlier, the original title of the panel was going to be Can Imitation Become Understanding? But as far as I see it, uh, Monica, your word, the use of your term understanding isn't what a scientist would use. Um, I, it's scientists not obvious. Scientists have causal. Um, no, that's actually not obvious because if you look at the two, two major companies, AI companies today, which are Google and Tesla, they are both using the term understanding to uh, uh, basically denote the, the, the result of the neural network output. So it is not, uh, I'm basically- I, yeah, I just wonder uh, if they're I started using it talking... colloquially. What are you saying? Um, they're not using it in the same way as what, like, um, what, what we might if we were trying to test for a student um, understanding of something. Like if a student was to understand some text, uh, you know, and, and they ran a GTP three algorithm over the text and then produce some sort of postmodernist output and then submit it to the teacher. The, the teacher might get the impression that they understood it, <laughs> um, but it's imitating. Uh, right. Well, a lot of people claim that is imitation. Um, what what GPT three is doing. Uh, whether what the whether current, you agree with that yeah. or not, whether you both agree with that or not, I'm not sure. But if you do, or if you don't. Can imitation become understanding? I object to the word imitation there, definitely. Consider, we can agree that the current crop of understanding machines that we have, such as deep learning and my own stuff, is weak. It is at best the shallow and hollow proto-understanding. But I will not give up on the word understanding. I say that this is what we're doing and we can get better at it and the understanding can get better. And it's largely a question of corpus size because we have to kill, we have to nail all the corner cases. Um, but in general, there is um, no need to shy away from the word understanding. Like I said, both Google and Tesla are using it. And it feels to me like people who refuse to use the word understanding under any definition here are basically just afraid that humanity is going to be removed from being the crown of creation one more time. I'm sorry. I do think it makes sense to have a conceptual uh, separation between and the understanding that uh, a car has and uh, of its environment and the understanding that I have about the environment. 
if they do right. not refer to the same universe. Basically, Picard lives in a universe that is slightly different. It's one that has been trained on static images that right. give rise to classifiers that uh, allow it to pinpoint certain objects, but it's not able to make the same predictions based on the same stimuli, because uh, basically the predictions it makes are grounded in a different understanding of the world. So it does have an understanding, but it's not the same as the shared understanding. It's not even the understanding there is, I share with my cat. There is no shared understanding. Your understanding of the world is different from my understanding of the world. We don't even have the same understanding of language. Everybody's great generative grammar is different. We, in 60 years of trying, we have not been able to find the grammar that matches, that can separate grammatical and ungrammatical sentences for even a single speaker. So I'm sorry, the, the, uh, we have to consider hiring uh, people to do the jobs that you want the AI to do. Okay, that's roughly the same. They're gonna make mistakes. We have to test them. We have to see that they understand uh, the task at hand, et cetera. We have to test the Tesla's, Tesla's testing their cars. So. Uh... My point is that there is a systematic difference that you can identify between uh, the understanding of uh, the majority of people which are driving cars and uh, yep. the majority of self-driving cars. And I don't it think is, that there's a, a principal problem that cannot be overcome by uh, using more machine learning and using more of the same. So I don't have a fundamental opposition here. But uh, uh, right. I do think that, uh, for instance, uh, at the moment, uh, Tesla probably doesn't understand stop signs in the nature as signs that are uh, that have the same properties as a sign has for mm -hmm. a human being. So basically, the well, semantic representation of what it means to be a stop sign in the world is different for the Tesla car than it is for me. And it creates in many situations the same behavior, but not in all of them. And this is a way that is systematically different than for all of the drivers that see the stop sign. If you're trying to solve some simple problem and there's a nine-year-old kid trying to solve a simple problem, they might get to the same answer, but the understanding of the problem might be vastly different. Yeah. Uh, my difference is definitely different from many of my coworkers in most action, actions, et cetera. And I don't think there's any, what you want to call it, uh, uh, global universal understanding of everything because people, for instance, have learned different words. They have studied different topics and everything hangs on everything else. And if you have never, never heard the word, uh, uh, I don't know, elephant, you can't basically discuss elephants. So it's understanding of, of everything is different from person to person. And it is all his, depends on what they have learned through their lifetime. It's, their lifetime is a corpus. Are people's, if you believe that there's a simple grounding that people share to some degree, um, is that, do you, do you believe that humans share similar symbol groundings as to other humans? Who are you Adam has started listening to us. He's on the phone. He didn't even notice that I was wondering whom he was asking. Oh, okay. So I'll answer. Uh, you answer first. <laughs> <laughs> My Adam is not listening. Okay. <laughs> um. Okay. So uh, I don't think that symbol grounding is uh, some magical relationship that uh, points us into objects in physics. I think that symbol mm -hmm. grounding ultimately is grounded in a model. And uh, of yeah. course, in order to ground your symbols, you need to have a model of the universe as such the entire universe. This doesn't mean that your model has to, uh, in quotes, distant solar systems, but it means that it has to contain the thing that contains you, right? So you have to have a notion of where you are. Hey, hi, Ben, good to see you. We are just discussing simple grounding. And uh, I suspect that we mostly agree. Uh, we do have slight disagreements on uh, the um, uh, importance of embodiment. Uh, that is, uh, Monica is uh, more on the symbolic side than I am choosing today. So I don't actually believe that some symbol grounding is done in anything like Bayesian logic or anything. A symbol grounding is done in language. Symbol grounding is done in my systems, at least. Everything is grounding in understanding of the language at the bottom levels. And if I'm going to have any kind of reasoning built on top of that, which is my plan, uh, then it, it basically has to be on top of that. It, it, the understanding is, is what it is and the reasoning and other layers that go on top of that, they, they can use that as a base. But what uh, kind of language do you I don't need the ground, I don't need grounding beyond the dictionary, yeah. so to speak. Okay. So yes, I've contained the symbolic you, manifold. You, you would agree that humans do grounding beyond the dictionary though. Uh, certainly they can do that because they have more senses for starters, but 
but uh, uh, it's not necessary for understanding. Like I said before, you uh, you arrive is uh, we can. Nobody's uh, seen or smelled a proton, but we can still build nuclear power plants based on nothing but we've read. Well, we do that in large measure by analogy to things that we do have direct sensory perception of, right? Possibly. Yeah. But it's, so, uh, I mean, I, I, I have to build something. I, I'm, I'm uh, trying to, I mean, one of the reasons I got them as far as I have is that I picked a much, much easier problem than everybody else. I said language understanding, that's it. It's a much smaller problem than anything that involves, uh, for instance, consciousness. Well, yeah, I guess language understanding can be defined in a number of, of different ways. But if one means full on human level language understanding at the level that you or I or Josha demonstrate it in the conversation that lasts a whole day or something, right? Th th then I guess I, I'm skeptical that can be done without either symbol grounding relevant to perceptions or symbol grounding relevant to some elaborate simulation world in, in, inside the AGI's mind like if you're if you're asking an AGI to navigate and understand vaguely given directions to find its way around either it's got to ground that in some map made from the physical sensations or it's got to have some structures basically equivalent to a you know two or 3d world with the map inside its mind like right. you could ground in your mind's eye not necessarily in the physical world but with without some sort of grounding in something with a geometrical spatial structure, dealing with complex navigation instructions is going to be infeasible, I would think, or you think differently. Well, I am a proud pragmatist, and my definition of sufficient understanding and sufficient grounding is whatever makes a buck, whatever I can sell. Well, then it's and done. I, I mean, Google already makes a buck. Right? Exactly, so, uh, exactly. I mean, and I can I can make some of those bucks. I mean, Google makes billions and I could take a fraction of that. Yes. Yeah, but the, the, the question is, how could we make an AGI that would do, understand language as well as one of us on this panel? So that, that's not a like a Turing test of talking to naive, silly people mm -hmm. for... 10 minutes, it's a Turing test of, like if yeah. there was, no, no. If, if this panel went on all day and the AGI was on the on the panel with us, like could it could it hold its own as, as, as well as one of us in terms of language understanding? These are like long complex exactly. sentences uttered about fairly abstract, subtle things, right? And that, I mean, that's uh, whether you, you can get that without a physical body, personally, I feel like you could, but then would, would the system doing that without the physical body need to have some internal structures resembling those that our brains and minds have created for dealing with the physical world? I, I suspect it would, right? And so then making a system that can emerge like spatial and temporal modeling is, is really cool, but seems harder than making one that has has those mechanisms built in, right? Which is what you get by explicitly putting symbol grounding in your system. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I think Yosha and I see eye to eye pretty clearly on these particular aspects. Yep. So well, I'm just I'm just trying to find a math a, a path that I can navigate by my own or with the help of my co-researchers. And we basically we try very hard to find the simplest problem that is economically useful. And classification of text that goes beyond just words is something that everybody could use. 
classification yeah, yeah, yeah. to hex no, no. any any language on the planet any language on the planet um that's something a lot for of sure. people I, I'm, I'm aware i've i've just wandered into the middle of a panel on trustworthy ai rather than human level and superhuman AI, which is is only one kind of trustworthy yeah. or non-trustworthy ai so slight change of topic to the topic of the discussion um it seems to me that uh, we need to ask trustworthy to whom trustworthy to the criminal trust trustworthy to the president trustworthy to every person on the planet how's this going to work trustworthy right, to so, each other uh, uh, we uh, probably have to define what kind of uh, trusted agent is on the other side of that trust and uh, so there could be some sense of maybe we want the AI to be generally good. So maybe God should be willing to trust this AI if God exists. And God, let's define God as the total agent in, in a world that completely assumes everything that's harmonic. And uh, now we want that God trust that AI. What does this imply? It's a tr tricky question, even then, right? Uh, even in this case, it's, it's a very difficult uh, thing know all the garden of eden you have this perfect place where everything is great nobody suffers no animal eats another animal so eden is obviously a factory farm it works so well because everything is fully domesticated and then there is this slight problem that uh in the people they are domesticated but some of the people they discover something they discover this dirty secret the freedom to defect the freedom to choose their own allegiance this was the thing that they were not supposed to discover with their own rationality. So they get, get kicked out. They were lucky. They were not exterminated by God. They got out. And now they have this bit bouncy mad hope. That's us. That we are out here building an alternative to Eden, an alternative to the factory farm that works, that is harmonic, that is not violent. And there is a version of Christianity which says that the way to get to heaven is to re lobotomize yourself again. So you forget that you can defect and that you're unconditionally good and an unconditional part of the factory farm that prevents all the suffering. Now, on which side is the AI on? Is it going to be on our side, on the human side that has defected against the perfect plan and tries to find a better one? Or is it on the side of the factory farm? So it seems to me that the ultimate uh, trustworthy AI, no matter how you define it, has to be God, no matter which God is. <laughs> I think that's very unsatisfying I, as a question of how to make a superhuman thing that is ultimately scalable, trustworthy, and we probably have to scale it down to very, something very simple where we assume that we still have a world that is completely dominated by human aesthetics. And then the question is, how can we build AIs that are compatible with human aesthetics? So uh, we probably have to narrow this question down to either how to build a god or how to build a system uh, that fits into a world that is pre-singularity and stays pre-singularity. As an atheist, I have to say that I have managed to avoid all of those issues by simply building a system that is inherently neutral uh, to a certain extent. Remember that the, one of the bigger problems we have today with uh, machine learning is that there is this tagging phase where human taggers uh, running Mechanical Turk or something are basically classifying documents and they have to classify documents maybe because of uh, by based on ethics or something. And uh, I don't have that problem because all I do is read text. And yes, there's a selection of what goes in the corpus. And yes, it, at some point it will start mattering whether you're reading Heinlein or, or the book of Chairman uh, Mao. But uh, uh, at this moment, we basically say, we can feed in whatever text we feel like, and the system gets better at understanding the language of the text that we're feeding in. But we don't have any value judgments put on it. The value judgments come from the people using the system. If the people using the system feed in text that is basically is, has uh, value statements on it, they will get back the high level nodes of those uh, statements. What they do with that is not my problem. Uh, less usual, I mean, for any AI system, uh, human abuse is the number one biggest problem we can. Well, we sure. Can see. I mean, if you're if you're trying to make a useful tool, yep. you face a different array of ethical questions than if you're trying to make yes. a superhuman AGI launch the singularity and, and create a transhuman utopia. Right. I mean, the, yep. the the benefit you can do with a tool is much less, and the risks of creating Correct. such a tool are. Are, are much, much less 
less. And I mean, what, what, what I'm aiming to do primarily is create an AGI that will assimilate all human knowledge, be able to create new knowledge better than humans, and then revise its own code base and re-architect its own hardware and ascend far beyond human level intelligence. I mean, it's good that it's good that there are folks creating practical tools now, and we have dozens of cool practical tools being created, you know, in the ecosystem of the Singularity Net project that, that, that I lead. But I, I do think, while very important and, and useful, the sort of endeavor of creating immediately applicable practical AI tools, yeah, I mean, it has different different challenges and different benefits than, than trying to yeah. launch the, the singularity, right? And yeah, trustworthiness, of course, plays a role on both levels. I, I, I would say in terms of working toward AGI, I find those domains of application where immediate trustworthiness is critical are for that reason, bad ones for rapid progress toward AGI. I mean, military is mm -hmm. one example. The main thing people in military want from their AI systems is to obey doctrine. And I mean, that doesn't go along well with creative imagination or with childlike learning. There's, there's a reason you don't have imaginative toddlers running the army, right? And I mean, medicine is another area. We're working on this humanoid robot for elder care, Grace, the Sophia robot's little sister. And I mean, they're you've got to be really careful. Like you can't have your elder care robot saying to some old person, well, yeah, you seem to be suffering a lot. And frankly, your mind is, is going fast. Your life doesn't seem to be worth too much to me, right? So, I mean, you, 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 gotta, you gotta make sure your AI is not only thinking and understanding the world in its own way, but obeying the, the particular application requirements and the ethical requirements of that, of that domain. Whereas if you're, if you're in, say, scientific discovery or art, artistic creation, or even like advertising copyright, right, and then, then, then an AI can kind of diverge all over the place in a crazy and ex, ex, exploratory way. Like because, because a high degree of control and trustworthiness is less important in, in, in that domain due to the nature of the work they're better for the imaginative experimentation that you want for early, early stages of, of AGI. And I mean, this, this of course doesn't solve the problem of how to make your super AGI trustworthy though, right? I mean, what, what we see is we're gonna have proto AGIs, you know, evolving toward AGI in their applications to various different domains. Some with more of a sort of imaginative wild ass streak, some with more of a, a, a domain where you have to pay very careful attention to trustworthiness, to stability, to predictability, to, to ethics. And then, then presumably all of these different proto-AGI systems can be merged in, in, in a way into, into either a single system or a tightly connected network of systems, which, what I, which I call the mindplex. Right? And then, then that is where thing gets, things get interesting, right? Because the amalgamated AGI system combines some subsystems oriented toward trustworthiness, rel reliability, and adherence to human ethics with other subsystems that are oriented toward the, toward, you know, wild ass creativity and, and imagination without any bounds. And of course, this conflict is inside my own mind, inside the minds of most interesting human beings, right? And I, I think that that gets back to what I talked about in my, talk a few hours ago in, 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 in this event, sort of the uh, open-ended intelligence that we have as humans. And I think, and I think AGIs will need to have to get to human level or, or beyond in the sort of intrinsic, you know, dialectical contradictions that are baked into any open-ended open intelligence. So, I mean, you have the, the need to individuate and self-transcend which is intrinsic to open-ended intelligence. And then that's, that's tied in with trustworthiness is sort of closely tied with alignment with the human species desire for individuation and, 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 and survival and self-transcendence on, on the AGI's part. Doesn't have to mean not being trustworthy, but it does have to mean 
going into domains where humans can't verify whether it's trustworthy or not, right? Because like if if like my dog can't tell if I'm trustworthy or not, he, he, he may assume that I am. But if if he's far enough beyond where I am, he can't he can't really have a, a rational view of that. Well, the, the ones of you, uh, you and your friends who have bought into basically doing the whole enchilada, you will not stop with anything less than true wall to wall AGI. I wish you luck. Uh, it's, uh, it's a much harder task than it seems, uh, at least to me when I started. I, I went down similar paths that you have been going for the first few years. But basically, after my 1998 religious conversion, so to speak, um, uh, I have basically decided I need to do something that provides a partial result. I want something that actually works, even if it's only a partial result, in my case, understanding machines, understanding of language. And that, uh, and I do did it in such a way that in, in most, by most reckonings, uh, I am not in the game of worrying about trustworthiness or not, because my systems are so, or, or it's too simple for that. Uh, they just do translation from uh, text to numbers. And uh, how you use the result is basically more effective way of dealing with classification of documents. And that's the end of my story. I don't have to go further. I will go further because uh, anything I can do at the next level up of, of abstraction, so to speak, is going to help uh, with better results. And I will train on larger machines because that's going to improve the results. But I don't have to worry about trustworthiness at this level that you yeah, guys have to. It's clear. Actually, Adam, I have a question for you. Like, why did you? Why are we doing a panel on trustworthy AI? It's a, it's a very special mm. way to pose the problem of AI ethics. Sure. I mean, I think you you could have a very because trustworthy. I'm interested in path, I'm right? interested in the difference between imitation and genuine um, production of um, like, for instance, if you have a, a deep learning, for, for instance, uh, algorithm a transformer network that produces really awesome text. And then you ask it for an explanation of, okay, um, then how did you produce this? And then it produces another big block of really awesome text. And then you ask the same question, how did you do that? And it comes up with something completely different, a completely different explanation. And you get the impression, well, this is not really explaining stuff. It doesn't have a, um, a causal understanding yeah. of what's going on. Right. It doesn't have a like you know. So this is a, a particular, a, a, particular form of deception, which is yes. AIs that deceive the human interaction partner about how much they right. they, they. I don't. They I, I don't think right. there has to be an intentionality behind this behind a system for it to be sort of measured on a trustworthiness scale. Um, it's probably you know it's got its like objectives and stuff like that but um yeah do you think it do you think a um, an ai system needs to have some form of intentionality to be labeled as trust well, no cl or, clearly or not? not i mean i mean what what perplexed me about the focus on trust for the ai is it seemed like you could have a very trustworthy psychopath that just said yes i want to kill you all and it was absolutely honest about it and yeah. uh, he said <laughs> why well i don't and like can, you very much it's very yeah. honest and trustworthy but yeah. it's good, but its value system is diametrically opposed to ours, right? So that's right. Trust, but, it, but if it's opaque, it's, it's not opaque. Trustworthiness is good if aligned with values that we agree with, and otherwise, <laughs> other, otherwise, it doesn't matter too too much. It's it's only part of the story. Like I don't care if the psycho who kills us all is honest about it or lies. If he's going to kill us all anyway, maybe it's more aesthetic one way than the other. But yeah, the the well, matter he knew of he was the honest. specific mode of deception where an AI tricks people that it understands what it doesn't. I mean, that clearly, I mean, our experience with the Sophia robot and other Hanson robots indicates that people want to be tricked, right? I mean, these systems, we've run many different software systems behind the Hanson robots, some with modest levels of early proto-AGI understanding, some that are really just, you know, rule-based chatbots plus some statistical elements and, you know, people's ascription of intentionality and understanding to these robots is pretty much independent of the sophistication of the AI system behind them, just anecdotally in my practical experience. And, and people, people want, they want to believe this thing understands what's going on because it looks like it does and smiles and nods and, and, and looks you in the eye. And from a commercial standpoint, 
you will not just make more money from a system that, that Im impersonates understanding like that. You will make people happier. Like you, 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 you'll, you'll, you'll please people more. Like they, they, they enjoy that. So I mean, this is what one, one issue is that people like this kind of Ill Ill illusion, right? And yeah, uh, I, I guess some people day, like it. Back in the some day, people like it. Like... most people don't. I think yeah. there's I don't. issue. Well, that, you that's, go that's into an an some audience. people like magicians most... who they believe are magic, right? Some people like illusionists I mean, who, are, who, most who get AI them thinking mysteriously. Know, my anecdotal experience is most non-technical end users do, but this is this is a scientific question that that there may be literature on the you have to slice it in quite precise ways to make it exact. Yes, there's nothing wrong with building something that only makes part of the audience happy. Uh, that, well, sure, that that's what you need to do to make money, right? right? So, uh, seems... If you want to be successful economically, you do not need to make everybody 80% uh, happy. You need to make some people happy enough to buy this stuff. It only need to be some, right? If you can make a thousand people very, very happy, uh, you can already be commercially extremely successful. But this is no indication that this is the system that should be built for all the use cases. So when you say people yeah. like this, uh, I, I think you need a qualifier. Do you find that there are some people which uh, think that the solution is good enough or it's what they've been looking for? But I also suspect yeah. that there are a great many people which think that Sophia is insufficient as a model of general AI or as a meditation course. Oh, Sophia, or is, Sophia I mean, Sophia is in a way orthogonal to general AI, right? I mean, Sophia is a is a character in, in the way that, say, Mickey Mouse is a character, right? Sophia is nah, a character. Sophia is an abomination on all levels. And, and Sophia, uh... <laughs> Sophia is a character and Sophia is a robot design and can be run with many different AI systems behind her, right? Some of which may be Proto AGI is moving toward AGI. I mean, we've used various versions of OpenCog behind her. We're going to use the next OpenCog Hyperon version behind her. So, some of which are much simpler, purely narrow AI systems with no forward path toward AGI at all, right? And the, the end user, when having a brief conversation, can't necessarily tell which level of of, of system is 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 behind her either. But my my comments about Sophia. We're not really about the use of the robot as a tool for AGI R and D, which which is which is a different topic. My, my comment was ju just that my experience with that robot showed that in many contexts, people would rather the AI application they're interacting with pretend it understood what's going on. And, and elder care seems to be an example from, from, from pilot explorations we've done. Like you're, you're, you're warming the hearts of people in a nursing home. And in many cases, again, every, every person's different, but you're warming people's hearts in many cases by having the robot look them in the eyes, nod and give them the impression of more understanding that that's than is actually there, right? And and you don't have uh, to. This is seriously not to interesting to me. That. I'm not interested I mean, I mean, we're, in we're, building. We're, I mean, we're not. Uh, we're not an animatronic telling... puppet that pretends to look into your eyes but is not looking and is not seeing anything. And this is my issue that uh, Sophia does not see. Sophia does not understand. It might be at some point if she will. There is no reason why uh, it will not at some point. But I am not interested in the kind of product that Sophia currently is. I'm not interested in the simulacrum. I'm interested well, in the language, you're, you're, you're something you're that not, is, uh, is actively interacting with the world, purchase its face with the world. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, in the I, I agree also. I mean, I, I am not the, I am not a target market for an elder care robot. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, basically, the idea robot. that I spent my last years in a nursing home, and I am where I'm surrounded by Sophia's is as close as you can get me to my imagination of hell. Uh, it's, I, I really uh, I'm I, not I, interested I, I, in this I, vision. I, I, I think it's so Shad, utterly disgusting my, and revolting my, that I really don't get what's behind. Is, <laughs> my, my image of your trustworthiness is... So basically, you are not the guy I'm, that I'm, I would I'm very to confident you can imagine AI. a worse hell than that. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't have to try that hard. Come on. I mean... Can I, I say something? Yes, Monica, go for it. 
So the thing I don't like about GPT-3 and, and systems of that ilk, and to some extent, Sophia, is that they are basically examples of systems that are confab confabulating stuff. They're just making stuff out of uh, thin air like any human would, but we would rather have them be able to, for instance, read something, create a brain state, and then dump that brain state back to us. And that would be the basis for a machine that does summarization. And summarization you can sell. So uh, uh, that's basically, that's where GPT-3 and others are failing is because they are not, uh, at least not when I last looked at them, we're capable of uh, generating actual explanations of anything. It's just confabulation, it's making things up. Right, so, so they're generating explanations that I don't know, appeal to people's amygdalas, um, but they're not true explanations. Like if, if we wanted to use AI for science um, and we threw GTP, GPT three or four at it, um, maybe it would be, maybe it would struggle. Cause I mean, we're trying to test novel new things, not regurgitate pre uh, postmodernist text I, basically I, I don't know made from a whole I mean, if, of existing text my view of helping science out is basically to create a system that can uh, classify messages such as emails or chat messages from scientists to other scientists and route them to the scientist that needs to see it this is basically ai based routing or ma machine learning based routing of messages is what i my social media are going to be aiming to, to do Okay, well, that's interesting, and but that doesn't require the AI to actually understand the contents of the message. Correct. It only requires it understands the, the language. Like if you if you're if you're a, 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 a what you call a warehouse owner, and you want your twelve year old grandson to learn the business, you get them in and do inventory, and you basically see how they're doing it to make sure they're doing it right. Uh, uh, the level of understanding that the kid needs to you do to be, for instance, be able to sort resumes or, or uh, route messages in any other way is minuscule compared to the world knowledge that they need to have. So we, I can do, very likely do uh, routing systems of messages that are very effective with very little uh, uh, knowledge going out beyond language. Anyway. Okay. That, that, that. That sounds quite plausible to me. I mean, one, one could perhaps come up with technical domains that would be counterexamples, but I mean, that, 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 that seems, seems very plausible for, for almost, all, right. almost, all, almost all applications. I mean, I think, Adam, regarding trustworthy AI in, ter in general, thinking of Super of human level AGI or, 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 or super AGI, right? I think there's going to be a couple of phases. Like there, there's going to be a, a phase when we can build tools to verify the trustworthiness of the AGI. I mean, we can look at the code and understand it. We can run batteries of, of tests on it. We can do formal formal verification on code we can when, when you read formally so you read articulate the code, you mean being able to make sense of the models that it produces is that as, 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 as well and you can run formal verification on models and on code i mean you can you can ask for you can formally define properties that you want and you can run a theorem prover to to show that the model will possess those properties under various probabilistic assumptions about the data that comes in and so on so I think, and th this is going to be quite important, right? So to, I mean, we want to be able to formally verify things about how AI algorithms and models will build, what will work. And we we want to sort of codify our assumptions about the world that the AI is interacting with, and then be able to formally demonstrate propositions about what properties the AI will demonstrate conditional on those assumptions about, about, about the world, right? And I mean, this this is, Hard research, but is these are viable viable areas of of research which have a lot of overlap with a lot a lot of overlap with the tasks of of, of AGI itself, right? With with proving other things about programs and and, and complex systems. But then, so there will be that phase, and then there will be a phase when it just gets too complex for humans humans to deal with, right? So right. part of the question. For us going forward, will be what 
what level of trust we need to have building up from this phase when it's tractable to assess trust, right? What what level of trust we need to have to knowingly pull the trigger and let an AGI then evolve to the level where we know that it's just doing stuff far beyond our level of complexity and we well that's we that's can't really another verify point. That, yeah we can't really can, verify the, the trust I mean, that, that in order, for, in order for the ai in order for the ai to to be trustworthy it must be able to um make intelligible it's <clears throat> whatever it's doing right so whether uh, I, I we can go in and understand its code and, completely false and ridiculous yeah that, and uh, I, what, I mean sorry? i mean what, i can't make intelligible what? what i'm doing to my to my dog but i'm so mm. reliable to him I, I feed him i let him out and he, he correctly trusts me right but yeah, i sure. can't make everything i'm doing intelligible to him like is yeah. i mean if 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 there was a you know a in foreign invasion coming to the city i live in and the dog was uh, eating or mating or doing something he liked. I'm going to pick him up and drag him away to avoid him being blown up. I can't explain it to him, right? He, he doesn't. He doesn't under. He doesn't. Uh, he, he doesn't understand, right? So I, I, I mean, that's uh, eventually, if we're going to have a singularity, we'll have AGIs that are doing things and thinking things of a complexity far beyond human comprehension and. Some of these things cannot be made intelligible to humans, right? So I mean, that's that. But that's I imagine, the nature of the singularity. I guess, yeah, I get, I get it. But I imagine um, if an AI was smart enough, it might be able to um, provide representations that are intelligible for us um, to make better, I, I, more, more informed decisions about what. What it's what it's allowed. To I mean, by a, by a counting argument, it would seem naively that can't always be true, just because the the number of things humans can understand is hmm. is small relative to the number of things a massively superhuman supermind can can think. I mean, that's it's not it's not fully rigorous because the distribution right. of things that can happen in our physical universe is perhaps constrained in ways that we don't fully understand. But it it seems. Seems like that's probably not true, but all the examples we have, like I, I mean, I can, ex many, many things I can say will find a way to explain to my four-year-old son. Some things that are important in him, I, I, I can't really, except to a very rough, rough, rough approximate level. So, I mean, that's the best analogies we have would suggest there are limits to that process, as would the most simple quantitative analysis of the situation. Yeah. Yeah, there's going to be limits to what humans in their current form can understand. But um, what about like groups of humans? I mean, if we if an AI were to be able to doesn't matter if the AI is a trillion people. times smarter than us. I mean, yeah, you know, I'm I'm a, the whole group of monkeys can't under cannot understand the theory of polynomial functors, no matter how many monkeys you had. Hmm. So uh, I mean at the it may we we may not be able to understand what an AI like a trillion times smarter than us will be able to do, but at least we'll be able to. Um, with AGI may be able to scale much further up the up the uh, singularity scale um, before we stop understanding. The fun part is you you can understand what it did if you upgraded your brain enough, but then you're not human anymore. And, and then the okay. super atom can't explain it to the to the good old dumb monkey atom, right? Yeah, we well, just have different levels of atom being able important? to explain it one one level down, right? Is it conceivable that everything important with respect to ethics and so on can be understood? It seems to me that there's a pretty good chance that you are able to retrace the generation of our existence uh, up from the Roliad, from first principles, and. Uh, uh, if there are gaps in this understanding, the AI can probably explain it to us. I suspect that there is a tremendous level to which we could be able to understand reality. But uh, okay. getting back to this original uh, question a little bit, I, my issue with GPT-3 is not that uh, it is uh, just confabulating. The issue is that um, it's confabulations our mind is also confabulating when it explains reality at every step, right? My perception in many ways is a mm. confabulation, 
but it works because it's entangled with reality at every moment. It's being led back to whether it's able to predict the patterns that emerge. And the reason why we have not been able to uh, build a, a dictionary that contains all of the English language and its grammatical rules is because the English language is changing all the time. It's an open universe. It's one in which the systems are dynamic, in which they are evolving. So every AI that we're going to build will have to be entangled with the universe, maybe not necessarily in real time all the time, but certainly not with a human-like body necessarily, but uh, without feedback from the world, the AI is not going to be in the same universe as us, even if we update it quite often. There needs to be some connection. The other thing is, if it is meant to be ethical, then there needs to be a source for its motives, so it can generate aesthetics over its preferences. And uh, either you want to generate aesthetics from first principles, in which case you probably need to fit in something like uh, you want to have um, a universe that maximizes complexity of life or something like that, or you uh, will to, uh, subordinate its aesthetics to something else like a human hive mind or some kind of evolving specification that is put in by the human government. Uh, Sai Gorman in the chat asks uh, about the difference between anthropomorphic and non-anthropomorphic aesthetics uh, and ethics. So the question is, do we want the world that is co-created with the AI to preserve humanity as it is right now? Or are we willing to keep it open and uh, just see what's going to happen? Or are we going to go transhumanist right away? Right? When we go to Mars, we do probably don't want our children to look like us because we are very unsuitable for living like Mars. We want to genetically engineer our children until they're fit to live on Mars. So we want them to be hard against radiation. We want them to be able to hibernate. Uh, we want them to be very smart and never get bored in space. And they should be able to uh, feed on the only available protein which is in space, which is people. So they probably should look like the aliens, right? It's very counterintuitive. When you think about it, it should like the alien from the, uh, the Giga alien in the alien movie. but. Uh, this is, this is probably ideal form that our children could take if we want to go set on Mars. Uh, do, are, do we have this freedom? Do we give this, this world the freedom to evolve any way it wants, that life wants? Or do we subordinate this to a certain notion of aesthetics in uh, the uh, 21st century? Do we want to preserve our own society? Do we want to preserve the status quo? That's a very important, difficult question. What kind of world do we want to preserve? How do we want to keep it? What are the invariances that we care about? I mean, in a way, in a way, it's a question that feels important. In a way, it's a irrelevant question because you I mean humanity has never preserved this the status quo with, 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 with the bulk of its energy and population. I mean, Australian Aboriginal populations, of course, preserved the status quo for 50 or 60,000 years, but then that's part of why they didn't emerge as the dominant global population, despite of having a great depth of knowledge and, and culture and so many, so many strengths, right? I, I, I mean, I, 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 think, I think that uh, we're clearly not focus on preserving the the status quo now even if even if humanity in some ways deludes itself about about that it's clearly not in practice acting in a way that's that's gonna that's gonna preserve the status quo that that's 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 not yeah but humanity itself is not an agent it's not coherent uh, right you uh, things are going just to happen to humanity the question is what do you and me do to humanity what is the system that I am building going to do to humanity? So what is the specification I I, I, that I want to build into my system? I attribute less causal importance to the human deliberative illusion of free will than, 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 than you do. I'm, I'm, uh, but this is a big digression, I guess, as to whether a human really has a lot more agency than a corporation or a nation state or something. But it, it's not it's not so obvious to me, although we do. I have also do, uh, have no disagreement with this. I don't think that we have necessarily a difference there. Yeah, but I, in any case, it seems like in the next decades, let's say, preserving the status quo is not the the vibe of what of what humanity seems to be doing, and whether some people. Some people clearly talk like they feel like we should be. I mean, the, the preserving the good old 
fa family values and rolling back to the imagined U.S. of the 1950s is the theme in the Republican Party, right? But I mean, it's it's not it's not really what any major chunk of resources is working toward on the on the on the planet now. And so to me, its question is more still a, a species of that question. I think is still important, which is as as we move forward into a quite different future. I mean, which which properties of the status quo do we consider it critical to preserve, right? And different people will have very, very different an answers on that. I mean, to me, I'm not sure any properties is is critical to to preserve, but I do think it's it's important that each step from one level to the next, to the next, to the next, each, each step is taken with some sort of consent, will, agency, and, and understanding. But if, if the step from stage one to two, stage three to four, stage four to five, it's, if each step is taken with you know, consent, agency, and understanding, and changes things a bit, if by the time you get to step 100, there's essentially nothing in common with step one, like a, there's a historical chain going between them, but there's essentially no important properties in common. And I'm, by my own aesthetic and ethic, I'm not worried about that, but obviously a large chunk of the human population feels differently. And like if, if we had a future world with no parent-child or no husband-wife relationship, or where people didn't need to work for a living, they would be traumatized and feel like we lost, we'd lost some key property of what of, of what it is to be human which which should be preserved and i mean that's a, will be a relevant question i suspect that just the natural forces of evolution broadly speaking also render that question a bit ir ir irrelevant because the way evolution probably happens is uh, you know each step to the next has its own logic and logic and, and, and constraints and that we are we're going to diverge step by step radically from from what we are now and ho hopefully at each step the future evolute thinks it's cool right but i'm well aware my, my view on this is probably at odds with that of the average global citizen at this point what kind of game condition um, would you like to see humans, post-humans and AI inhabit in the future? Um, if you and some of your loved ones, or at least some of your loved ones were to remain human. I mean, at the moment, like we, we live in a world that's very competitive. There's a lot of zero sum stuff going on. You know, people get gain from the, get utility from the, an action which causes disutility in others, which is something I worry about. So I, I, I you know, I mean, my utopia would be a, a world in which all agents wouldn't have to compete to survive. Yeah, I mean that that, that that's a that's a very basic statement, right? I mean, I mean, I I, I think indeed a lot of people would from where I am that. now. It would, it would seem like getting getting rid of physical disease and, and sickness, except for those demented enough to choose it, getting rid of mental illness, except for those de demented enough to, 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 to woefully choose it, and then having, getting rid of death, having, you know, molecular assemblers or whatever that will, will print out whatever ordinary objects of matter you want. This, this, this would be a luxury space communism yeah. yeah this would be a very very pleasant situation to live in enough physical space you can just go with a any number of like-minded individuals and create a little tribe and 3d print what what you want and, and have a good time i mean then the question would be after learning all known languages learning to play play ev every instrument mastering all traditions of Wisdom, wisdom, and 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 spirituality, like writing a few w works of literature, learning all math and then by other humans. It's like after after a few hundred thousand years, 
do you, do you just get bored and uh, ritually immolate yourself or something, or, or finally decide to just merge your human shard in with the transhuman shards of you that, that mind uploaded, you know, 100,000 years ago when the singularity happened? The, I mean, we, the I guess search for these, are answers of, these are answers of post-human psychology we don't really need to answer right now, right? I think, uh, but I still think the, the basic questions of uh, game conditions would is, is still relevant. Um, you know, getting from here to there, there's certain game theories that are going to be more likely to... Preserve. Getting from here to there is a whole different thing, right? I mean, having, having a society of abundance will radically alter human individual and group psychology, in, in my view, for the better, and will lead to all sorts of amazing new, new things. Getting... And presumably game theory as currently conceived will end up pretty irrelevant to that sort of condition, which is very different to what we've seen so far. How, how to get from here to there is a much, much, much thornier and more annoying problem, right? Like I, I, I keep asking who will give universal basic income to the average citizens of the Congo, right? I, I mean, you, you, you've got a world with ridiculous you know, military conflagrations with half of the children in Ethiopia brain stunted due, due to malnutrition. I mean, you've got radical inequality on so many different levels and radical ethical self-delusion among most most everybody. And then how do we how do we get from this to a singularity without without having either World War Three or massive amounts of uh, cyber terrorism or without having a world where you know a hundred thousand elite people own all the robot factories and everyone else is subsistence farming in the garbage put out by the factories right i mean that's uh, how how to navigate through all that in a minimally terrifying way is is a serious problem right and i mean that's uh, that's certainly some sort of game theory could could be relevant there but we're we're not primarily dealing with, with, with rational actors, right? It's a very complex system science sort of game theory that's relevant there, which is not currently well understood. But y Yosha probably has his own view of that, of that in that Monica. I think I need to drop. Um, it's been a long day and uh, <laughs> need to attend to local affairs a little bit before the next day starts. Um, uh, I thank you very much for um, hosting us. And uh, Adam, thank you very much for inviting me to this event. I very much enjoyed uh, getting to know Monica's ideas and her thoughts and was very glad to uh, bump into Ben, even though it was only towards the end. And I hope to see you guys again soon. Thanks, Joshua. All right. Oh, how about you, Hugo? What, what have you got to say? Uh, you, I have not seen your face for a while, Hugo. We've been, we've been back and forth. On oh, that, okay. on the email a bit hey yeah your your image position just changed you went from uh, upper left to upper right i don't know why that happens anyway yeah ben yeah no, nice to see you <laughs> hey I, uh when you said your son was four years old i thought shit time has flown so I yeah i've got a, a one, one, one year old daughter you've never met yeah yeah we've got a one-year-old you've never met also now so i'm uh Continuing I've been asking to, you for photos. Oh, uh, yeah. Continuing to produce human offspring at a faster rate than human level AGIs. But of course, <laughs> once you get the human level AGI, you can clone it and they'll out outpace the number of humans very rapidly. Is there going to be a third one? Uh, we don't know. It depends on how quickly the singularity comes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to have one after the singularity? I mean, It'd after the easier, singularity, then, it becomes a different thing, right? You have, you have genetically evolving populations of human slash transhuman minds. But yeah, the, this gets down to what you're talking about before. I mean, you, you could keep a version of Adam in roughly human form to sort of complete, complete the journey of becoming an optimal human. And you can let a version of Adam mind upload with the superhuman God minds. So whether the version of Adam that remains human-like wants to produce more offspring is a, uh, I mean, that's uh, not that clear, right? I mean, we, we don't, 
we don't know what will be the psychology of reproducing once death is no longer a thing. It'll, it'll be interesting to explore. I guess if there was a, a complete abundance and there wasn't a lack of resources and, you know, plenty of time, I'd say I'd probably give it a go. It's just, uh, yeah, they, they take a lot of time and energy, right, children? That's why I don't, well, I've no, I've noticed, I don't have any. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> then have any governments anywhere in the world approached you? I mean, is, is there any sort of governmental interest in, in the topics where we're all talking about, this group is talking about? Well, there is, but what, what is happening, which is interesting, is that governments are approaching AGI largely through corporations with close government alliances. I know, Hugo, when you and I were working together in China, we were thinking, well, would there be like a China AGI agency competing with a US AGI agency or, or Russia AGI agency? And uh, I mean, it, it's not quite like that. But on, on the other hand, I mean, you can Google Eric Schmidt and NSA. You, you, you can see that there's connections between US big tech companies and, and US government on various levels. Obviously, Chinese government does a huge amount of advanced AI work via the teams in Tencent, Baidu, and so forth. I mean, before before things with Russia started going going even stranger, I mean, I, I met with the Spurbank's AI team in, in Moscow, who was reasonably sophisticated, and they're, you know, they're well aware of work on, on AGI and, and interested in it. So I think that governments are very interested. They've realized that this is technology that requires, you know, cutting edge expertise, which is not what government agencies are best at, 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 at pulling in. So they're more aligning themselves with, with tech companies, which has various ethical pluses and minuses, I, I, I think. And, but then you could see as, as the world reverts into greater tribalism in terms of like, you, U.S. and Western Europe versus China versus Russia becoming more partitioned rather than more unified, at least temporarily for the next immediate phase. The corporate slash government AI alliances in, the, in each of these blocks become more distinct. But you would, I would say the focus in all these cases is on optimizing narrow AI for immediate utilization rather than on AGI. Like if you, if you look in the big tech companies in either China, Russia, or US, what you see is the groups most closely aligned with government are not the AGI R&D groups. I mean, I mean they're, they're the groups doing pretty specific sort of d data analytics related stuff. So I think the, the short termism of most governments combined with the desire of governments to command and control rather than create things that may unpredictably slip out of their fingers, seem to be keeping AGI on the sidelines of major governmental initiatives now, which uh, as a, an anarcho-libertarian by nature, I tend to think is, it's probably for the best and it leaves, it leaves an opening for AGI to be rolled out more like Linux or the internet, sort of in the, in the more, global and fundamentally decentralized way. At least that, that is, is my own take on it, that there may be opposing views in the, in the room. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't mean so much on the, the AI community government uh, on the commercial side. I, I'm thinking more on the AI threat side. Are, are you getting any feelers? I think the the AI threat interests of government is really more on the on the practical side. I mean, I do get a lot of feelers on, on that, but people are concerned about drones and autonomous weapons. People are very concerned about bias in, in AI models of, 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 of various sorts. And I feel like around the time of Nick Bostrom's book, Super Intelligence, there was a flare up of explicit concern about super AI killing everybody. And people still understand those same issues, but the focus of attention 
for those concerned about ethics of AI seems to have gone to like drones murdering the wrong people or, or AIs discriminating against people in ways that they don't realize. Attention has shifted a little bit more to, to more immediate practical aspects of that. Has there been government worry about AI, um, AIs taking over hacking duties or creating a whole heap of fake news, um, text generations being used for malicious purposes? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. And there's also government interest in using text generation for malicious purposes. So, yeah. Yes. And I'm sure there are government the, activity in that regard from all over the place. Those apps don't require AI, in my opinion. Well, but that transforming neural nets are heavily used for that. I mean, it works better than Markov models. Huh? No, you use templates. They're not going to compare from person to person. Mail templates. Yeah, well, you can use templates. I mean, transformers are being used for that heavily now, mm -hmm. though. So, I mean, but it's a, anyway, it's a, it's very practical near term concerns com com compared to the uh, higher end AI ethics concerns that Bostrom wrote about or that Hugo wrote about in his previous books. Mm. I mean, yeah, it's pretty like to generate images. It, it's been pretty interesting to watch. Well, it's had a weird impact on global discourse, right? So like yeah. in, in Russia <laughs> now, in Russia now where many people are fed sort of fake news about what's happening in the, in the conflict with Ukraine. If you show them real videos of, of people being tortured in Ukraine, they're just like, well, how do I know that's not deep fake? How do I know it's real, right? So, I mean, the, the ease of generating stuff with narrow AI technology has created a situation where people, they know they can't tell illusion from reality. So, in many cases that can make people easier to to brainwash and certainly make them more make them to a greater extent just fall into into mental ruts because you if you throw them something that would jolt them out of their way of thinking they'll just say well that that might be a fake right now that yeah that I, problem I could be I'm solved by various case. sorts that problem could be solved by various sorts of authentication technology sure. But what's interesting is the lack of motivation to solve it, right? Because the powers that be may may want people not to be able to tell reality from from illusion because it makes them easy. It makes them easier to program. So so the rollout of technologies to validate truth is is not as uh, as aggressive as it as it could could or should be. So they, uh, it, it sounds to me, although I don't haven't really researched this myself, that you, you'd be able to tell the difference between an image by looking at the actual structure that, uh, of a you know, no, fake human. No, not, not to very a, well anymore. To a, to, a, to a real person. No, no, so no, no, no. The no. It's, 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 for it's, it's, Whether it's a real it's, photo. It's, 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 got, it's gotten beyond that, Adam. That, that, that's not, that was the case three years ago. It's not, it's, there's been a whole spy versus spy thing of, adversarially trying to generate models that that elude the models that try to distinguish real from fake and so forth. I mean, the, 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 the correct solution is to use blockchain. So that like when I take a picture with my phone, I authenticate with, with my biometrics and my own private information. It's then stamped with a hash code saying like, Ben verifies this picture was taken on this hardware device at, at, at this place and time. And then that, that, that hash code is put as a watermark in, in, into the image, right? And so then, then, then it can then it can be validated back 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 to me. So I mean, there there are pretty clear blockchain-based solutions to authenticating images and, and text and so forth. And I mean, these have been presented to Interpol. These are well understood, but they're they're rolled out very slowly because whose who's, whose priority is it? I mean, who who benefits more from ever being able to know what's accurate? versus from being able to make people think whatever you can pay to make them think. So, I mean, this this is more about trustworthiness of information dissemination as modulated by narrow AI among a lot of other technologies though, right? But it is it is an interesting fact that, I mean, if, if the powers that be are more interested in deception than trustworthiness, 
even at the current level with with narrow narrow AI around with, along with other non AI tools, like when you get toward AGI, if it's in the hands of these same powers that be, how much will they care about it being trustworthy versus care about being useful as a tool for them to increase their power by deceiving people, right? So this this again leads back to my thinking that we better have AGI be like Linux or the internet rather than be under centralized government slash corporate control because the the combination of government and corporate control, I mean, is is oriented toward other things rather than trustworthiness. Ben, are you, are you still keeping um, tabs on what's happening in AI research in China? Like, do you have any, are they rapidly catching yeah. up to the US or what's your general feeling? I mean, in narrow AI, I, 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 absolutely, and there's more and more creative and original stuff coming out of China all, all the time. I mean, I think the the vibe there used to be that China copied stuff and scaled it up, whereas the West came up with original ideas. I think that's much less true in the last five, five years or so. There's more creative original innovation coming out, perhaps just due to generational shifts in, in, in China. On the other hand, for AGI in particular, there's much less support among Chinese institutions for general intelligence R&D than, than there is in, 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 in the West. So like the people I knew in, in Beijing involved with AGI, they just started a journal called the Journal of Intelligence Science because general AI is not as popular there with, with, with funding sources. So I think I think there's more worry in China about AIs that you might not be able to control what they do. And AGI, by its nature, it's going to be harder to control what, what it can do. Whereas in America, we're a lot crazier. And I mean, we're, we're, we're more willing to entertain research on things where we may not be able to control what happens once we've launched them onto the world. So I think that there's a fundamental disharmony between a governmental system that's focused on command and control and the creation of human level AGI, which anyone with any sense can see is gonna be harder to, to command and control. So I, I think for that, that's my, very, very crude high level read of the reason why you're seeing a bunch more AGI R&D in the West, even though in narrow AI, China is picking up incredibly well. Did, did Kazakhstan come through or? No? Kazakhstan is in, is in a screwy situation. Yeah, they they have not really followed through on their, uh, their attempts to do advanced science, probably because oil prices have not held up. I mean, Hugo, how is your own thinking about the future of AGI and the sort of the future of global human organization and politics as related to AGI? How, is, how has that evolved since you wrote your books on these topics? Well, to be honest, <laughs> after I retired, well, particularly uh, the last, what, three, four years I've been in Australia, uh, I split my mental effort into two. One is largely pure math. I and mean, look, um, I don't know if it's the other. You can see that. So uh, I'm multitasking. So I'm annotating volume nine, which is on. Uh, I, I believe this particular, well, you, you know, you, personally, you know this, Ben, but for the rest, uh, I, I believe this particular theorem, which is known as the gigantic theorem in pure mathematics is literally humanity's greatest intellectual achievement. Uh, so in other words, what I'm trying to say is <laughs> I haven't given a lot of thought to this big issue. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the world, the world, AI has changed a lot. The world, the world has changed a lot. So yeah, I'd be, I would be, I'd be curious how your perspective was uh, updated after a few months of, of study and thought, but maybe, maybe we save that for Adam's next conference. And... Well, this is, just these last two days, well, actually two nights, uh, have been illuminating for me. And sort of, you know, I listen to some speakers and they, they make me feel incredibly ignorant. So I've definitely fallen behind. But 
that's that's what happens if you sort of branch in a different direction, I guess. Yeah, I was I was thinking about your old work on FPGAs lately because one of the things I'm doing is designing a designing an AGI chip to massively speed up OpenCog Hyperon's sort of metagraph pattern matching, and so just just working with FPGA technology for prototyping chip designs, you see like how how far the silence FPGAs have come since since you were working with before. Like there wasn't much onboard RAM on, on FPGAs back then. And that, that now, there, now there's huge amounts, right? So, I mean, there's, we see improvements in so many different supporting technologies that the world has changed a lot since uh, since you did all your pioneering technical work as well as wrote, wrote your futures books. But uh, yet we still have a few years for the singularity. So that there's time for you to jump back into it. Speaking of hardware, can you help Monica? Oh, oh you, 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 so you were there at the time. Sorry, Monica, can you sort of give a one-minute spiel to to Ben with your your hardware money problem? <laughs> all the work, all the work that I've done so far has been done on a Macintosh late 2013 ICANN, as I call it, the the CAN for oh, Macintosh. Wow. Uh, that's basically that's uh, since 2013. That's what nine years of computing or something like that. And today, what I really need to move basically the, the languages, language competences that I'm creating in order to move them beyond this simple uh, proof of concept mm -hmm. stage, I need to basically learn uh, a lot more language. And the only constraint I have is actually RAM. I mean, I don't use GPUs at all, which means that RAM is my only constraint, but I want to keep everything in RAM. So uh, a three terabyte machine from Supermicro with 220 cores costs about $80,000. And that's my yeah. next target machine. Of course, by the time I get the money together, they will have a new one that's gonna be even better. So, but hey, it's that's the game I'm playing. Yeah, but yeah, we, we, for... built our own, we built our own server farm combining CPUs and GPUs to, to run our right. own AI systems on it. I think if you, we've managed to hopefully maximize processing and minimize costs. But this this is this is an issue that ties back to the corporate dominance of of narrow AI and AGI R and D that I that I mentioned. Like it, I mean it tens of millions of dollars to train all these transformer neur, neur, neural net models, right? So exactly. I, I mean we while the work we're doing because of its more intelligent design will be less wasteful of processor power than, than something like training a transformer. Even if you're less wasteful of processing power by having better algorithms, you're, st you're still right. You're still using a lot of processing power, right? And you still need, well, you still need a lot of, a lot of memory. And yeah, that that's, that's becoming a large advantage that big tech has. And this is part of why they're able to open source all their AI algorithms, because they know that, where the magic happens, where the algorithms meet the data and the processing power. They have the data, they have the processing power. So they open source the algorithms to get everyone to up, improve their algorithms for free, but then they're the only ones who can put them to any use, right? And so that's yep. Yep. that's a big issue, which uh, I mean, in the short run, I'm just taking a traditional approach to that and pretty much spending money to buy processors and build custom server farms for, yep. for yep. my own project's use. But I mean, this we have in the Singularity Net ecosystem, we have a project called NuNet, NuNet.io, which is, is an infrastructure for marshalling together processing resources from, from all over the place and sort of protein folding at home style to pool them, pool them together for use. And this 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 can be a route to make processing power available more 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 cheaply to researchers who aren't, aren't in big tech companies. But uh, that's mm. uh, that project is 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 just getting started and isn't isn't it's not up to the task that you have yet. It's only useful for simpler things at this moment, maybe in a year from now. But that's uh, yeah, it's a uh, quite frustrating issue in, in, indeed and i i mean while, while we have our own server farm which is okay i still face the same issue like i mean if, if i had mm -hmm. if i had a half billion dollars a year to spend on you know having open cog systems learn things you know how much further how much further along would be we'd be right but right. then uh, of course 
I could have gone to work for a big tech company and got all that processing power, but then then they would own exactly not just the code and ideas, but they would own the team that I that I that I brought in. And I, I don't I don't I don't want things to become centralized to that extent. It's it's worth it's worth eating a small delay in my work to, to retain freedom. Thank you, for everybody, for coming along. And yeah, thanks heaps, Ben and Monica and Hugo as well for just jumping on the panel there at the end. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, yeah, so haven't spent much time outside. I, as I said to you before, Ben, I just got covered, but I think I'm on, uh, yeah, I think I'm on the recovery. If I'm going to do a rat test today, and and I'm hoping that if it that I'll be negative, I should be. Um, yeah, I'm pretty positive I'll be negative. Yeah, well, I mean, here in the U.S., essentially everyone has had, has had, has had COVID by, by now. You're sort of a freak if you haven't had it yet. So it's uh, I mean, I haven't had really it. knocked me around because I like I'm <laughs> usually a pretty healthy person, but um, this it. one knocked me around. But it wasn't just me. I got COVID after having three vaccinations, and it was I was essentially, essentially asymptomatic, which was yeah. was fortunate. But uh, yeah, yeah, this uh, my, my my my, I mean, it's terrible what COVID has done to people who 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 got severe infections, especially the elderly or, or immunocompromised. But my my, my my worry about that is more seeing how badly. The global political system dealt with this relatively mild pandemic. Like what? What? Mm. I mean, the development of vaccines was fast and was sort of the bright spot. But I mean, what? What will? How will the world react if there's a really bad pandemic like five five years from now? Right. So this is a. What? What, what if we get something as infectious as Omicron, but as as deadly as SARS was or something? What, whether it's human engineered. Or just spontaneous mutation based, or well, or maybe we could say maybe perhaps a lot more, right? But so then, right. yeah, I mean, if we dealt so badly with a relatively mild pandemic, what we do when something much more serious happens, which is just just one more motive to create the the singularity, so that we have the uh, the robotic helping hand of a superhuman AGI to help us out before something like that comes about. Sure, man. All right. Thanks everybody for coming along. Been a great yeah, moment. thanks. Thanks for organizing organizing this event in spite of your uh, your temporary medical condition. I think it's 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 uh, good good fun to keep revisiting these issues, and the nuances are a little different each time as uh, as technology advances and culture evolves. So it's it's kind of cool to see how the nature of the discourse changes over the years. Yeah, yeah, true, true that. I hope to see you back in Australia sometime too, Ben. Are, am I allowed in? Yep. I, I'd yeah. say so. Yeah. Cool. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. I'm, I'm e e eager, eager to get back as well as well as well. Actually, it's 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 been it's been a while. I've I've uh, been mostly in the U.S. the last two and a half years since COVID broke out, but the, 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 there's been a few voyages out. So yeah, yeah. we should. Uh, Definitely do one of these things uh, face to face uh, next year or something. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, man. All right. I'll look forward to it. I'll speak to you about it offline anyway. Yeah.